My name is Federico Pistono and I come from Italy. I have a diverse background and diverse interests. Halfway between a scientist, an activist and an artist and you know, somebody who just wants to make the world a better place and help people out as much as I can. I worked on media and communications for many years. I was a screenwriter, a director. I was making videos, I was building websites, thinking about communication strategies. Parallel to this, I was working uh, also for um, non-profits and NGOs. Uh, I joined the Zeitgeist movement. It's a, it was an international movement and I started the Italian chapter. Then I became one of the international coordinators. We talk about really social change. Social change through an emergent new cultural uh, awareness uh, about really a sustainable uh, society. I actually have a, um, a bachelor degree in computer science and artificial intelligence. That's my scientific background. And, you know, as, as, of our, as I was going through the social problems, there was one topic in particular which was keep, keep coming back, which was technological unemployment. Now that's just a fancy word to mean automation, maybe a robot, maybe a software, maybe anything which is not human, displacing human labor. So what do you do? Well, I'm just, you know, I'll find something else to do. Fine. Worked out just fine for 2,000 years. Well, what's the problem? We're always going to have, you know, something else to do. Problem is, when you have an exponential increase and you double the very small numbers, you don't really notice anything. But then when you start to double big numbers, and we are starting to double in big numbers, then you have a problem. Because machines are displacing human labor in those areas which we didn't expect for another a hundred or a thousand years. There are automated lawyers. There are some companies that they used to have, let's say, a hundred lawyers inside, and now there are just 10 or 15, and the rest of the team is being automated. There are automated journalists. Yes, some of the articles you read online are written by robots or, you know, bots. And you don't know because they have a fake name. It's called natural language processing plus machine learning plus some evolutionary algorithms. Uh, so they take in the data, they process the data. Some of them are called uh, Bayesian networks, uh, uh, neural networks, uh, uh, support vector machines. I mean, there are sophisticated techniques to uh, kind of gather all the data, make sense out of it, and it's, you know, it's just data. It could be financial data, it could be sports data, you know. Then they bundle it up together, but then they provide a context and they share it in a way that is compelling for humans. So right now it's more real estate, finance, sports events, but this is just the beginning. In the future, we could be having, I don't know, a Pulitzer winning journalist and then turns out to be a robot. Art, we already have robotic art. They, you know, you show a hundred people, random uh, people, say 10 pieces of art and you say, do you think any of this was made by a robot? Sometimes they get it, most of the times they don't. Even the critics, they say, oh, this is really beautiful. <laughs> oh, you see the struggle for existence and you can see his lover here, he, she left him or whatever. They say, no, actually it was done by a robot. I'm like, nah. I think we give meaning to things. So if I see a machine creating something and I think it's creative, then that's my view, right? I don't think the question if those machines are intrinsically creative doesn't even apply because how do you know that I am creative? Just because you say I'm creative then I am or because someone thinks I'm creative. I don't think there are intrinsic values in creativity because it's subjective. If enough people fall in love with their machines then those machines will be romantic. If enough people think those machines are real great artists then they will be creative. Obviously when people hear about these stories they say ah oh, come on we want to praise replace every job. I mean, you still need human contact for some things. You need context, you need to see a human face, and that's true. However, the number of jobs that require such a contact, which they do, and they will probably forever, are very little, very few. And most of the jobs right now in the, in the economy are automatable, meaning they could be automated if we wanted to. Now, this is a crisis under the current economic paradigm because if you break the cycle of labor for income income for consumption because you have no income then you cannot buy anything so the economy breaks if you break that cycle it's a crisis however think about the opportunity if we just think about a different way of distributing resources about thinking 
the way we live and why we work and why we live and what makes us happy, we could utilize this immense potential of automation to free ourselves, to liberate ourselves from monotonous, repetitive, stupid, mechanical jobs and finally do what, you know, makes us happy and fulfilling, and that drives us, keeps us in a state of flow so we can finally become what we want to be, not who society told us to be. You, who do you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to be an engineer? Do you want to be a teacher? Do you want to be a plumber? Do you want to be what? I don't know, maybe I, none of the above, you know? Why do you have to confine yourself to a specific uh, piece that society, like a label, like they, they put a label on you when you're 70, or you, you've got to choose you. Think about your future, think about a work, think about your job, university, uh, don't take a humanitist, because you'll never get a job there, be an engineer. Be, fine, maybe I want to be an engineer, maybe I don't, maybe I want to be something else. Maybe the university that I would have to be in to be happy doesn't exist. Maybe it's a different type of school. Maybe it's, a, it's not even a school. Well, it, it already ha it's already started to happen. So the process started many years ago and it, during the past five or six years, uh, it started to grow quite substantially. And I predict that within 10 to 15 years, the, the changes will be so drastic that the economic system will have to completely change. I mean, even Richard Branson, you know, is not exactly a communist, he said, Screw business as usual. The, the, the people who created and helped shape the current system, they are seeing the shortcomings of this system. Because it was good 20 years ago, you know, it created the wealth that we are experiencing, but maybe, maybe that kind of system is not adequate for the kind of technological and cultural change and shift that we are experiencing. So we need to upgrade the system together with the abundance paradigm and the DIY innovators and the driving force for a, a new technological advancement and social change, there has to be a strong cultural component which does not rely on economic growth, more consumption, more energy, more, 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 but maybe more of a dynamic equilibrium, more like a sustainable approach in look what we have now, that's what we, what we have. And then, in the future, if we can get more, fine. But, you know, let's be more responsible. I think computational speed will increase along the lines of Kurzweil's predictions. However, computational power doesn't mean that the singularity, as people think, like, as people think it will happen, as it happens, meaning computers exceeding human level intelligence. Let's say a computer does Oh, our, our brains do 10 to the 16 calculations per second. Let's say we build computers or clusters of computers in the cloud that make 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 calculations per second. Maybe the software that they are running isn't nearly as efficient as ours. Maybe it's more efficient, but it works in a completely different way. And, make, and doing a comparison between the two is inappropriate. It's like, you know, uh, bananas and oranges or apples. I mean, we are already kind of hybrid, you know, I access the world's knowledge on this bone and 20 years time will be blood cell size and could be directly inside my brain. The connection and the, the speed of information between the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain is X. If I make that synthetic, it could be a million X. Or I could be transferring information to your brain telepathically or wirelessly in this case faster than my original neurons would speak among each other. That will change definitely the way we communicate and then the way we think. I think machines are, well up to now, they do what we tell them to do, what they are programmed to do, what they are designed to do. So in a sense they are the reflection of our values. If our values are still mindless and, you know, super conspicuous consumption, competition, uh, um, aggression, uh, overpowering, stealing resources, you know, war, that kind of thing, then I guess it's possible because we'll just transfer our values to them. However, we have seen a tremendous decrease in violence overall and, uh, you know, Steven Pinker talks about that in The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, which I suggest to all of you then our technology will reflect these values. So, uh, I think it's, it's up to us.